Be Rad podcast is brought to you by MoFo, male optimization formula with organs to boost testosterone. Brad's macadamia masterpiece, mind-blowing nut butter blend, now offered on Amazon. Chili technology, temperature-controlled mattress systems for a good night's sleep. InsideTracker.com, offering blood, DNA, and fitness tracking data all in one place. And Organifi, whole food organic superfood supplements and drink blends. And please visit the shopping page at bradkearns.com for my personal selection of favorite products for health, fitness, and peak performance with great discounts for listeners. Here we go with the show. At the foundation of yoga is breath practice. And at the foundation of practice of Tai Chi is a breath practice. And at the foundation of most martial arts is a breath practice. We've got people today that are convinced that if they don't go get their run or they don't go work out, they're not going to be healthy. A gorilla in captivity, he doesn't put on a whole lot of body fat. How come? Well, they don't have the ability to actually put on body fat like we did. That was our gift, was to store things in order to survive if we weren't getting food. Hey, listeners, what a treat to welcome Brian McKenzie back to the show. After almost two and a half years, he was one of the first shows ever on the podcast and also remaining today, one of the most downloaded episodes. So boy, this guy is cutting edge. He's got some really interesting insights to discuss always and also a lot of philosophy interjected. So we're going to have a wide-ranging conversation. Some of it's going to get pretty scientific, just jumping right in there. So if you fall behind, just try to uh, extract the big picture insights about breathing. Uh, but you're going to love his his style because he's really reflective and he goes much deeper than the typical approach and mindset about athletic training, human performance, Oh my gosh, he talks about how we're obsessed with capacity. What's the most you can do, the best you can do. And performance is really, uh, has many other facets to it. And breathing is his uh, main area of interest now. His organization is called shiftadapt.com. And he's coming to there from his lauded history, uh, founding CrossFit Endurance and then founding Power Speed Endurance, but always on the cutting edge stuff, exploring the, the limits of the human and how we can optimize performance. So today we're going to talk a little bit about his background. We're going to get some interesting CrossFit Endurance insights about how he got started, uh, with kind of a, um, uh, an alternative approach to endurance training rather than just hitting the hitting the mileage and struggling and suffering trying to build a stronger organism to persevere through these endurance athletic challenges and today uh with the central focus on breathing at shiftadapt.com and we get into some of these really popular uh current insights about uh stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system rather than the fight or flight sympathetic nervous system and how important breathing and our technique that we use for breathing uh, is contributing to those goals. Uh, obviously, this has been a centerpiece of yoga, tai chi, meditation for thousands of years, but we're just f- now bridging that gap. And I think Brian's on the leading edge of this effort, bridging that gap to apply uh, breathing protocol to athletic performance. Uh, essentially, the goal here is to make your workouts less stressful. So the way to do that is by improving your tolerance to carbon dioxide, not through breathing in more oxygen. So I think I'll tee you up a little bit. So when he gets a little scientific, maybe you can have some better grasp here. Uh, but essentially, we we already have plenty of oxygen in our blood all the time. You know, those little pulse oximeters they use in the hospital to track hospital patients and you put it on your finger and it shows 96 or 97 or 98. Uh, for the most part, unless we have an illness, we have plenty of oxygen. So opening our mouth and sucking these uh, huge breaths of more and more oxygen uh, is highly inefficient and it stimulates 
the sympathetic nervous system response. So if you can set the goal, the overall overarching goal in life is to breathe minimally through your nose at all times, except when you absolutely need to gasp for air when you're doing uh, high intensity physical exercise. So uh, steady state cardio at aerobic heart rates, you should be able to breathe through your nose for the duration of the workout. And when you breathe through your nose, you have all these uh, peripheral benefits or accordant benefits such as as stimulating parasympathetic function using the lower lobes of your lungs where there's more uh, alveoli, more oxygen-rich lower lobes of the lungs so you can get a more efficient exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And when you improve your tolerance to carbon dioxide by minimizing breathing rather than being a big uh, air sucker, when you minimize, when you improve your carbon dioxide tolerance, guess what? More blood is offloaded to the working muscles so you ex experience a performance benefit benefit. Hopefully that will help you when Brian digs deep and I will do a breather show with more simplified insights about nose breathing, parasympathetic diaphragmatic breathing. Uh, but for now, let's listen to one of the great philosophers of uh, fitness, athletic training, human performance, Brian McKenzie, shiftadapt.com. Here we go. Brian McKenzie, I am so glad to connect with you again. Um, Mr. Kearns, I'm sorry, it's over Zoom, but next time we we were close, but um, <laughs> we're, the world's opening up. Let's put it that way. The world is opening up, and we almost pulled off you being in the same area as me, and then you're just a little bit outside of my reach now. <laughs> uh, you know what? This is show number two hundred and fifty, sixty something on the B Rad podcast, and going back to 2018. Uh, your show was still one of the top five most downloaded. So it hit a nerve and we talked about some cool stuff. And I think we need to, um, we need to catch up because, oh my gosh, in the last few years, you've shifted, you've adapted, you've, you know, kept, uh, kept this trend setting going where we're the, the cutting edge of fitness and rethinking a lot of the, um, the notions. And I got to admit, I'm a drag ass on this whole breathing thing. Uh, I, you know, I, I feel like I have so much on my plate anyway, right? I'm trying to optimize my workouts and my diet, and oh, now we have to do these uh, th these crazy huff and puff Wim Hof things. Uh, but it's it's a lot more than that, and I think I'd love to centerpiece the conversation on on this because you you hinted at it at our last show, and now, boy, it seems to be the um, the centerpiece of Shift Adapt. And I'm going to set you up with a long question because I want you to take us through your journey. Uh, maybe even dating back to uh, CrossFit endurance days and power speed mm -hmm. endurance, and now this shift adapt organization, and kind of, kind of, kind of just give us the storyline. Sure. Um, I mean, it, yeah, what we're doing now, what I'm doing now, which, which, ironically, you know, although we're going to talk about breathing, I've been stating for probably the last uh, uh, five years that by the time people catch on to this breathing thing, we're going to be moving on from it. <laughs> and we are, uh, but <laughs> like any decent practice, especially like you look at yoga, there's a foundation to what it is we're doing and breathing is at the foundation of that. And, um, you know, I, when I originally got into coaching, um, even before I was doing it professionally, getting paid to do it, um, I could kind of see that there was, there, there were some under, there were, there were some underlying principles that were being missed, but I didn't totally understand what they were. Um, and, and, you know, it's taken a good portion of 20 years and maybe we'll get towards, get, get, get to this towards the end of things today. But, um, you know, currently now we're at a point where I don't think anybody I've recognized or have been able to find um, and this doesn't make us more important. It just means we're, we're, we're just looking at something that I, I don't know that anybody else has that performance is and the human performance experience has been vastly misunderstood. And we've looked at it from a capacity standpoint and we've looked at health from a perspective of ideas and health has nothing to do with ideas and performance really doesn't have anything to do with capacity unless to fit, unless efficiency is attached to it. And, um, you know, unfortunately capacity doesn't have to be a part of the process if you're efficient enough. And if you are opportunistic enough, and these things lie within what 
we call nature. And unfortunately, we try to remove ourselves as quickly as we can from the prophecy of what nature is and take on this more civilized world. I mean, I think this was the beginning of our conversation when we first started talking about how we love this minimalist lifestyle, but yet you and I both, if we were to, if we were to present people with our credit card statements, we, they'd be like, you're full of shit. <laughs> like, um, you know, cause we're all participating in this world that is very interesting and it's very easy to get caught up in, you know, and I'll, I'll quote a little bit of Greg Glassman, comfort and convenience. It is an illusion. Comfort is the different. Com- comfort is the difference between the way things are and the way we want them to be. And you know, it's a very difficult thing to chew on in a society where we've made it so safety is kind of not even thought about, really. Um, you know, like our we we don't really understand that. Um, yeah, we we've let go of the idea that we have to be on hot like aware of our surroundings all the time <laughs> due to the fact that we're not literally going to be killed, you know, around a tree, right? Like there's something waiting for us around that tree to eat us, right? Like we're no longer participating in that. And, and I'm not suggesting we need to go back out into the wild and live like cave people. Um, but, you know, I, I, th- my background began in movement and understanding movement and seeing discrepancies in movement. I helped, shift make make a make a little bit of a paradigm shift with inside the endurance world with rethinking how endurance athletes were doing things because I, what i saw was i saw people really just suffering and 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 and, and <laughs> that's the point that, i thought and, and, and oh, thinking wait. that 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 was the whole goal and, you know right. and barefoot do you know who barefoot ted is yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and Ted's such a wonderful human being and I've been doing ultras. I, I will. I, I'm no longer doing ultras, but Ted's been doing old. He was, Ted was doing, started doing ultras when I did. And Ted and I have been friends for years. Um, I mean, we're going on, I mean, it's probably close to 15 years. And Ted has always looked at this thing as kind of like this fun, joyous thing that he's mm. doing. And it's not this like supper fest that he needs to go out and do to prove something to himself. Whereas and this is where performance went, but you know, we, my background took off because I shift, I helped create a shift towards having endurance athletes look at endurance as through this skill-based approach and using strength and conditioning. And that great gave it more of this holistic approach versus just strictly going and running, cycling or swimming, you know, and there's nothing wrong with either of those three things. Um, but what I saw happening to people over periods of time told me a very different story that people weren't getting what it was that they actually wanted and they were, Mm -hmm. they're, they're getting what they needed and they didn't like what they needed. They didn't like that, you know, our wants and needs got separated and, you know, that was pain. That was discomfort. That was literally being injured and not understanding why we're injured, having nutritional disorders that, you know, were, were just huge and then you know this that we i kept pushing with this stuff and understanding movement and learning more and more about physiology obviously and then it was i got hit knocked on the head with uh somebody handing me a training mask and i put it on and i took a breath when i when i when i drew a breath in with putting this resistance breathing device on i sat up and organized myself differently and mm-hmm. that kind of blew my head open and i was just like oh Like I just used my diaphragm and in order to use my diet, well, we're always using our diaphragm, but I just use my diaphragm in a much more efficient way. And in order to do that, I organized myself very differently to do that. And I was like, just roll it X back to my time Hmm. in yoga and how I ignored (laughs) the whole breathing aspect of it. You breathe into a position, you breathe out of the position, you go through pranayamas, you know, you could do kundalini breathing, you could do, there's so many aspects to yoga and breathing and, and and, in essence, at the foundation of yoga is a breath practice. And at the foundation of the practice of Tai Chi is a breath practice. And at the foundation of most martial arts is a breath practice. Mm -hmm. And largely why those things exist is because the people that took the time to actually explore this idea 
learned that they had far more control over energy and movement through con breath control and allowing their body to adapt to that process. So I entered into this world probably, I don't know, eight years ago at this point, um, and just started exploring everything I could on it, namely studying respiratory physiology and then understanding the neurobiology of our respiration centers and how they're linked up into the brain, why they're linked up the way they are, how they're affecting us, all of this stuff. And it sent me down a big rabbit hole that had me exploring many different aspects of it. But really just instead of getting caught up in the hoopla of you know, wanting to be this breath guy or whatever. We just simply wanted to teach the principles of breath control, what it meant, what, why is breathing important and what can you do in order to adjust that, which is basically nobody's doing that. Most people are just teaching a methodology, which is perfectly fine. Uh, well, especially as applied to athletic performance and fitness endeavors. I mean, we know we can go get uh, instruction at the meditation retreat, yoga, tai chi. Uh, but I think that's the, the gap here is that, uh, like I admit to myself, I, I didn't, you know, I know how to, um, uh, breathe through the, the, the guided meditation. But then when I'm out at the track and, and gasping for air, uh, the mm -hmm. reason is, is because I, I ran so fast at high altitude, right? Well, maybe, maybe there's more there. And I think that's, um, that'll be exciting for, yes. for us to get deeper into. But before I depart yeah. from that endurance uh, reference a little bit, um, mm -hmm. it, it now appears years later, uh, there's some pretty strong uh, evidence argument that the cardiovascular training effect occurs across all intensity levels. So I, I remember people criticizing you, uh, for getting your athletes to jump up and down off the box or do the, the rope swings if they're training for an Ironman, because what's the, what's the direct relevance there? Um, but the direct relevance is now quite clear. Um, Doug McGuff says it really well in body by science. He says there's no such thing as cardio because you can't extract the cardiovascular system from everything else you're doing, including some brief explosive work that's going to, build strong glutes and hip flexors for running mile 20 to mile 26 on the marathon instead of shuffling it. Correct. I mean, your heart and your pulmonary system work with everything else in the system. In fact, they work with your psychology. So if I get, you know, as I start to talk, my heart rate will increase. If I'm talking about a subject that I enjoy or I'm engaged in a conversation, when I stop talking and if I shut my mouth, my heart rate will decrease, <laughs> right? You know, there's, there's, there's very good reason that, <clears throat> well, we're, we're an interesting lot, that's for sure. And that we believe that we need to go out and really work ourselves physically in order to do this thing called burning calories of which is very, it, it's, a, it, 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 it's, it's just been terribly misunderstood. You know, and, and there's a reason why a free diver can burn up upwards of 600 calories in an hour, just diving up and down in the water, holding their breath. There's a reason why a chess player sitting in a mm. chess tournament can burn 6,000 calories a day without really moving too much at all. Right. And yet we've got people today that are convinced that if they don't go get their run or they don't go work out, they're not going to be healthy and they're not going to exercise or they're not going to get the health benefits that they need. And that couldn't be further from the truth. And that, and, and, and I don't, and I'm not suggesting not to go not exercise. I'm, I'm suggesting maybe there's more to this than you understand. And there's far more that you could be doing for yourself to understand what health really means outside of the idea of what health is. Well, certainly with calorie burning, um, I love how Dr. Herman Ponser, his new book, Burn, is, is kind of, you know, blowing the lid off this notion that we're going to burn more calories if we work out. And he says yep. from his life's work in evolutionary anthropology, we burn the same around the same number of calories a day, whether we exercise or not. 
WTF? How does that work? I actually had him on Correct. for a second show and the second show was just challenging him with all these uh, devil's advocate insights. Like, what about the Tour de France guys? They are known to burn 8,000 calories per day. Yeah, guess what they do uh, over the ensuing four or five months? They, you know, they, they lay around when they're off the bike and they're extremely efficient to where everything starts to regulate and compensate. Therefore, um, you know, the, the foundation of the fitness industry is go burn calories and sweat toward a better life. And now mm -hmm. that's kind of been um, shattered. So yeah, man, go picking up the pieces. Herman's work is great. I loved his book, you know, and, and I love the theory that we evolved because of our metabolism. I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm kind of on, I was already on board with that in, in that metabolically speaking, like we're like, look, man we're, we are the only species that is consciously aware, aware of adaptation we are the only thing that understands we are the only sentient being that understands i can go do stress to create act, adaptability mm. yet we forget that stress is energy and and herman broke that entire process down um you know and I find it fascinating that, you know, we, you know, you look at like an ape, right? You know, you look, you look at these animals and you obviously read the book, but it was like, what happens to a gorilla in captivity? He doesn't put on a whole lot of body fat. How come? Well, they don't have the ability to actually put on body fat like we do. That was our gift was to store things in order to survive if we weren't getting food, Right. They don't have that. They put on more muscle, right? Um, and, and what, how, but the, the big thing here is that all energy in the human body is transferred through the pulmonary system. So, our, so our respiratory system transfers all energy, meaning whether it's 90% of that energy is aerobic, which means it's the oxygen we're pulling in. The other 10% is anaerobic, right? Which we still have to offload. The carbon dioxide is a byproduct of that gas exchange of, of what's occurring at the, at the metabolic level. Right. So I have to breathe off the CO2 that's coming out as a result of that. And we need more oxygen in, in order to buffer a lot of the hydrogen ions and the acidic processes that are going at those higher intensities. And this is why we've really looked at breathing as a principle versus strictly going, here's a method, even though you know, we've created a bit of a methodology around the paradigm within performance through a gear system, which is where we go from gear one to gear five. And we start with strict nasal breathing, which is an equal in and out inhale and exhale through the nose that works its way all the way up to gear five, which is a mouth in mouth out. There are times and places for mouth breathing. Unfortunately, it's not where most people think they are. It's, you know, it's an easy thing to think about well yeah when it's super intense yeah you go to any crossfit gym you go to any you 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 observe any runner on the highway and you're going to see somebody who's slack jawed and running around with their mouth open and you'll you have a fingerprint if that's what you're doing all of the time we know there's an inefficiency occurring at some at some stage because we can't actually maintain that level of energy and these are this is stuff we tested was the differences between nasal breathing and mouth breathing at specific intensities um and it, it, it's not like i just came up with this idea nose breathing <laughs> and was like everybody needs to be nasal breathing on, on the contrary we were like i wonder what would happen if we were nose breathing i wonder what would happen if we tested that under metabolic under, under meta under a metabolic cart and so we started doing that and one of the most interesting uh, things we picked up on was, you know, sticking somebody at 200 watts on a bike, having them breathe out of their mouth for three to five minutes and then shut their mouth for three to five minutes and then breathe out of their mouth for five minutes, three to five minutes, and then breathe through their nose for three to five minutes. And you had two entirely different systems of energy being used in that process with the same workload being done. What happened? Uh, they, their heart rate went up when they were mouth breathing or something? It's not just the heart rate going up or changing. It's the fact that metabolically what's happening is you're triggering. When your mouth is open, 
you instantaneously can offload more carbon dioxide and you can bring in more oxygen a lot quicker, right? Unfortunately, through one of the principles called the Bohr effect, you have to actually have enough carbon dioxide present to use enough oxygen. And it's not that you're not using oxygen if you're breathing out of your mouth. It's an efficiency thing. It's not a light switch thing, on mm. or off. That's not how we work. It's to what degree, because you've got trillions of, of oxygen molecules in a single red blood cell. Well, it just so happens that that red blood cell would prefer, the hemoglobin would prefer to, to hold on to carbon dioxide, which is the byproduct of cellular respiration, regardless of which process we're going through, anaerobic or aerobic. N nonetheless, that CO2 hijacks, it jumps back onto that red blood cell. And when it comes into the red blood cell, it offloads, it removes that oxygen so that the oxygen can then perfuse with a cell in that, in that environment. And that's where the demand starts to go up. And this is where a lot of the exercise scientists who were not looking at this stuff so closely were missing some of the points of breathing and breath control because they're, you know, they're of the mind. A lot of them are of the mindset. Well, breathing's just a byproduct of work. And, and that's just actually the tail wagging the dog. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and if I go work hard and just let my breathing happen, I'm just letting metabolic activity occur the way I'm, I'm, I'm working, right? But if I work and I control my breathing and limit my work to what my breathing allows, mm -hmm. I've now changed how that energy is, is working. So I then, it's not an instantaneous thing, but it's pretty damn quick. Like we're talking within a few breaths, it changes pretty quickly. And you can only go so hard with keeping your mouth shut. And then the fun, the interesting thing is, is how many people jump onto this and instantaneously are like, oh, this isn't for me. I can't do this. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't, I, I'm nowhere near what I can do with my mouth open. And that's the indication that you're nowhere nearly as aerobic as you think you are. Whew. Yeah. Okay, let's back up a little in case anyone's getting lost because uh, this yeah, is- Yeah, that, that, that was um, a, a big dump. That was a nice, that was a nice big dump. But I think one of the, one of the key insights to pull out there is that, uh, you just said, if we work at the capacity of our, uh, of our breathing. So in other words, you can try to keep that mouth closed, even during exercise and pull as much air as possible through the nose until we can't stand it anymore. Cause now we're doing 300 watts and we have to open their mouth. That's a whole different story. But that guy, Correct. that, that subject who's pedaling at 200 watts. And trying the mouth breathing and then the nose breathing. Um, what is, what is the advantage there that's happening when the person is, uh, I guess, uh, they're preserving or they're building up more CO2. They're tolerating more CO2 because they're not gasping for every breath. What's going on when you say, uh, profusion? Uh, I yeah. think that's a good thing to those working mm -hmm. muscles, right? Yeah. You're actually using more oxygen. You're actually more aerobic. You're actually more efficient. So what do I mean by that? When you become more anaerobic, you only get two currencies of ATP, right? So, so ATP is the currency for, it's our money for energy, right? So with anaerobic, you, you get two ATP on anaerobic cellular respiration. In aerobic cellular respiration, you get upwards of 32 ATP. And in some cases, over a hundred. Now you get the two really, really quickly without any mm -hmm. trouble. And that's great when you're sprinting and need to fuel that ATP to, to mm -hmm. do maximum output. But when you're going for 20 minutes, an hour, five hours, then you want the 30 to a to hundred. You are absolutely correct. And this is where it starts to have its real impact is, oh, well, I thought I was doing a moderately aerobic workout, but it tends it just so happens I wasn't. So I was burning through more glycogen and glucose than necessary from these anaerobic sides of things. So I was burning through more carbohydrate unnecessarily, right? This creates more of a stress effect. This requires more recovery. This requires more downshifting, more regulation. So this is where we see, and, and we can get away with this for years. I mean, I've got 
world-class athletes at this point uh, who I consult for who are very capable of going very fast and very and going through brick walls, let's call it. But their time has come and they're starting to feel the consequences of those things. <laughs> Brian, Brian's clientele is world-class athletes who have hit 35 and now are wondering, what the hell? How come I can't? Not even 35. Right, like right. A lot of these yeah. kids actually are much, much, much younger and they're dealing with this thing called anxiety that is mm. a byproduct of this as well because anxiety, there's direct con- correlation between lactate in the system and actually anxiety. And the inability to process that and being aerobically inefficient would mean you've got more lactate in the system than you can actually handle as well. And there's a lot to to that, but you will see athletes at this point who won't even show up for races because they're so panicked about their performance. And, and, and this is partly their job. Um, I've got athletes who, who, who are, have been afraid to even do the testing, just just some <laughs> testing because they don't want to score so low mm. that it's evident that they're where they're at. But yet I already know where they're at based on the behavior because we've looked at this with so many people that, and, and it's not that it's a low score, it's simply an assessment to understand how much more potential you've got. And people are afraid of that. That's the reality of this is that, They've misunderstood what performance was about. And performance was is not just about winning. It's about authentically competing and being yourself. And this is why so many professional athletes struggle with identity as well, is because once the game's over, they don't know who they are. They don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. And this is actually an epidemic that's going uh, the on. The weight and, of gold, uh, the documentary yes. led by Michael Phelps. That was a, that was an eye opener. And Boy, um, yeah, the, the mindset is uh, pretty distorted. And arguably, if people were working with your protocols and, and consulting with the right people, they could be just as successful, probably more successful, without all the without all the junk in their mind and the the recalibration and the, the struggles after off the course. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really simple. I mean, it's it's, it's not very difficult either. But yeah, it, it's um, I mean, it's completely evident, even if you're not somebody isn't talking about what they're dealing with. When you've got somebody like a Michael Jordan or a Michael Phelps or a Lance Armstrong, you already know these are Tiger Woods. <laughs> yeah, Tiger Woods. You already know. You already know because it's all about I have to win. I have to win. And it's already telling the story of what's going on. I know too many athletes in this realm and I've worked with too many to not know what the signature looks like. Mm. You know, it's the same signature and, and look, it's not just athletes. This falls into our corporate structure. This falls into the parents. This falls into the everyday person and dealing with stress. And especially around this time, especially with what's happened under this pandemic, um, you know, the isolation, the change in lifestyle, all of that stuff has had a massive impact on the psyche and the psyche affects the breathing as well. And so the breathing will respond to stress either way. It's a predictive system that, that, that is a systems wide thing. And your breath responds, whether it's through metabolic activity or my emotional system is going haywire. It will change. You will start to burn energy differently you will start to use energy much differently when you are heavily stressed Mm, so if we can take control of this involuntary action of breathing one of the one of the few examples of something we can take control of right we can we can take control of blinking if someone asks us to or take control of our breathing uh and i guess the basic insight that i'm i'm gathering is if we can learn to breathe through our nose as a default and keep our mouth closed like like uh, many other or all other animals in the animal kingdom that will kind of calibrate us toward a more relaxed or stress balanced state is that is that kind of an insight we could pull here you very much so i think that the base the the, the the real foundation of any breath practice begins with an understanding of the difference between mouth and nose breathing Indigenous cultures and animals understand this intuitive, intuitively. 
they, like it's just this innate process they pick up. You will not find an indigenous culture where they talk about them mouth breathing. You will only find if anybody's done their homework, which a guy by the name of George Catlin did, um, who's a historian, wrote a book in 1867 called Shut Your Mouth and Save Your Life. And it was because he picked up on the fact that of the million, million and a half indigenous people he had seen in North and South America, the largest difference between them and the civilized culture was that they kept their mouths shut and they did it on purpose most of the time because they were in fear of what would happen that they would get the black mouth, which is what we had. <laughs> Whoa. What's the black yeah. mouth? <laughs> well, a, a mouth decaying of uh, teeth and oh. crap, uh, you know, and people who's, who would breathe out of their mouths routinely. Um, no animal breathes out of their mouth sitting still. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the indication of sickness. And we are doing it. You can, you can see it everywhere at this point. Um, you know, not everybody's doing it, but there are enough people doing it. Right? But the moment I get up and go to walk, you will see people who just instantly mm-hmm. will open their mouth. And <clears throat> the other byproduct of this is our position has changed to something like this. Crunching his neck forward, people. The computer yeah, so, screen posture is yeah. demonstrating for you on YouTube. And, and and that posture instantaneously makes it difficult for my oh. airway to pull air into. So the fastest and easiest way to do anything is to chest breathe, uh-huh. which sets off my sympathetic cascade, which also I'm offloading unnecessarily carbon dioxide, which instantly moves me into more sympathetic activity, which now... I've just spent my day in a low level of low to mid level of more sympathetic activity. And I don't know why I'm so stressed. So the chest breathing, uh, this, this, uh, shallow panting breath that's been criticized to be, uh, stress promoting, uh, we're, we're offloading unnecessarily extra CO2. And are we also taking in more oxygen than we need to our detriment? No, we're always kind of at rest. Anything submaximal, you're always taking in excess excess oxygen. You, you like you uh, you actually exhale more oxygen than you actually can absorb, mm-hmm. which is perfectly fine. But mm. you know when you, when we start to get up to higher intensities, you will need to absorb that, which is why you will take deeper breaths as you begin to as metabolic activity starts to increase. Right, so you'll want to take deeper breaths because. At the end ranges of those lungs, your alveolar sacs are much more sensitive and they, and they diffuse much more oxygen and carbon dioxide at those end ranges versus these shallow, small ranges. That does not mean you should be taking deep breaths all day long. Your normal breathing should be short and small, but it should be through the nose where we're actually engaging that diaphragm and using more of the lower lobes and upper lobes of the lungs. And that's been a big misunderstanding, or at least for me and, and the, the stuff I've been exposed to, is that you need to take these deep, huge diaphragmatic breaths uh, w- with great aggression and, and, and blowing up your, uh, inflating your, your tube all the way. Uh, and that's the mm. proper way to breathe for stress management. And mm. that seems to be off, off course here from, yeah, from what you're I mean, saying. That- that just sounds stressful in and of itself, you know? So, um, you know, I mean, if you think about it, it's like, if it's not necessary, what's necessary. Right. And if I'm in a highly stressful situation, I may need to take a deep breath just to Mm -hmm. maybe a few of those. Right. And if I have a breath practice, I'm probably working through long, deep controlled exercises of breathing to actually stimulate to slow the energy down a lot more to actually bring my high level of intensity down to a calmer level, right? So breathing is actually the fastest way for us or the most, po- it's not the fastest, it's the most potent way to get, a vo- to get a hold of our nervous system, our autonomic nervous system. The fastest way is through the visual system, which is the eyes. So if I'm looking outside, which I just did, if I look out in the distance of the trees, I automatically trigger a response to kind of drop down. Um, this is a lot of the work that Dr. Andrew Huberman has done. 
who's a good friend. And, um, you know, and then when you've got something in front of you, like the screen that we've got right now, you are, it, you are instantly sending a signal, which your eyes are a part of your brain. They're not separate from your brain. Mm. They are a part of the brain. And so it's the fastest signal to the brain in order to change our activity. So being in front of screens all day is a good indicator that you're probably a little bit more stressed than you think or want to give credit to. And our problem is that we think we understand this when, when we don't really have any idea that we understand this. <laughs> Whew. I thought you were, I was going to guess the fastest way to recalibrate was getting slapped in the face, but I, I like gazing off into the distance instead. That sounds a little more, a little more doable. Yeah. So, nobody's freaked out. Nobody's ever freaked out looking at a sunset. <laughs> That's right. Looking over the, the calm ocean at sunset, um, not stress promoting. Okay. So this, this idea that we're um, unnecessarily or unloading unnecessary amounts of CO2. And if we kind of, get back into mm -hmm. you made that pinch sound on on the screen like get back into this minimalist breathing along with our minimalist uh, spending habits on amazon if, if we tone it down and i suppose build up our tolerance to more co2 because we're not taking these these crazy breaths are we going to get uh we're, we're going to get benefits not only in athletic performance but also at rest correct um you talked a Correct. little bit about the um, athletic performance yeah. part where the, the, um, the muscles are actually able to use more oxygen because we're tolerating more CO2 because we're breathing through our nose at 200 watts instead of opening our mouth and just getting the, the, um, the massive dump of oxygen. Yes. It, I mean, it'll feel a lot better. It'll feel a lot easier, right? At first, but the, 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 the it, it feels a lot easier to, to, to open wide. You mean? Correct. As we correct. normally do, even at yeah. low intensity. And here's why. We're, we're set up to breathe through carbon dioxide, not oxygen. We don't, we have very, very little in the system that detects oxygen levels. Hmm. Our, our system for, uh, our means for detection of low oxygen or oxygen being too low is to make you woozy and then pass you out. That's it. That's it. It's preparation for death. <laughs> so can't, can't say I've ever, ever been there. To, if you've ever talked to, or if you've ever heard stories, I've actually personally talked to several people who've drowned and come back mm. and they've talked about how of an incredible experience it was, how euphoric and beautiful it got where at first it wasn't, but then all of a sudden it became blissful. That's that oxygen getting low. And then you going lights out and into a dream state and being free to go. The fortunate part for these folks that I've talked to is that there were people there or they had washed up on shore and the breath that they took after passing out, because that's what'll happen. This is what happens in shallow water blackouts. Um, when people who are free diving are trying to hold their breath for longer than they can, oxygen levels get too low. They start to feel actually good. So they don't Ooh. know what that feeling is. Uh-huh. And all of a sudden, the next moment, it just goes zook. And you'll see this in MMA as well for people who don't tap quickly enough in, in, in chokeholds. And they'll struggle at first. And then all of a sudden, they'll get calm and then slow down and then boom, and then they're out. Oh. And it's the same thing, although it's being, it's the fact that you're just getting blood supply cut off to the brain. Um, but so our, back to my point is that we're breathing because of carbon dioxide largely and CO2, we have, we have what are called chemoreceptors that are set up in the aortic and the carotid arteries. And that simply indicates that nothing has happened yet. Blood is going outward because it's in the arteries, especially the aortic. Okay, which is off of the heart and the carotid, which is going to the brain. Those have the detection systems in them that, that, that uh, connect up to the brain stem. So from an unconscious state, we're in this constant predictive place. And we are a predictive system. That's how we work. We, we love making predictions about things. When we don't make the right prediction, the mind gets a little crazy. And that goes with everything and anything. 
So if I'm predicting to win something or to do well in something and I don't do well, what happens to me? <laughs> it's just the expectation prophecy, right? Well, carbon dioxide just so happens to be involved in that equation, especially from the psychological side of things. So when my psychology or my emotional state, it takes on too much or I'm doing too much thinking, I have suppressed my ability to tolerate carbon dioxide because I'm requiring more energy for the brain. And although we say the brain requires 20% of the en energy, that's not true if I'm actually somebody who's anxious or doing a considerable amount of thinking in my day. That goes way upwards of that. That's why we can see chess players who burn upwards of 6,000 calories in a day. Is the amount of activity that's going on metabolically required for that type of thinking goes up. And so we start to suppress our ability to tolerate CO2. So we start breathing more. And so the more we breathe and unnecessarily or huffing and puffing, the more I retard my ability to tolerate carbon dioxide, which is simply just the stress molecule. This is our indicator for stress. And so if I suppress my ability to tolerate that, I breathe more once that marker goes up. And here's the kicker for all of you fitness freaks. You can't out train this unless you actually play with breath control. So you can be a world class Olympic gold medalist, world champion, and you can be heavily CO2 intolerant and be aerobically inefficient at low levels. But you can certainly perform at high levels and go through brick walls for some time. It's just how long. And, and the tissue, the joints, the system takes the brunt of this, but mm. we're so flexible and we're such a flexible species. And we're so able to hang on to, to, to deal with stress for so long as any animal can. It just takes time. And so sometimes it's a year, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's a decade, but you'll see it. And it just starts to show up. And then I've got tissue that doesn't move well. I'm stiff. My back's stuck. My spine doesn't move. These are very good indications that we are been sympathetically dominant, stiff. Mm. The tissue doesn't respond the way it should. Oh, yeah. I mean, the nervous system is the nervous system. If I'm constantly signaling my nervous system to be in more, more sympathetic tone, I will have stiffer tissue. Mm -hmm. Bar none. Uh, so we can we can work on this, whether or not we're a beat up old war horse or not, uh, through breath practice, uh, along with all the other healthy lifestyle habits. But I guess um, the goal of building up our CO2 tolerance will directly correlate with being less stressed. And then how would we do that uh, on a day to day basis, both in and out of workouts? Very, very easy. So you, they're, they're on our website on Shift Adapt, there's a what we do tab. And if you go to uh, how to start a breath practice, which is right there, there's a free little link that goes into this and being able to do a, a, an exhale test. And that will show you where you stand, and what sort of protocols you can start with. Our membership actually offers ways to actually build on this in everything that we do from a standardized breath practice to movement flexibility stuff to strength and conditioning work to sport specific or cardio, I guess you could call it work. So if you're going and running or riding your bike, we have a program called sustain that we're releasing next week um, that is literally devised at the gear system in getting people through this to understand how to work with the whole thing. Uh, the gear system is just the escalation of breathing as you go through higher intensities of exercise or something. Correct. Right. Correct. Yeah. So we're starting with this gentle nose breathing, which we can practice at rest all the time. And then getting back to that bike example, which is so fascinating, uh, someone pedaling along at a comfortable 200 watts pace and either choosing mouth breathing or nose breathing, um, I'm going to raise my hand and say, you know, it's, it's a bit of a hassle. The snot's blowing out of your nose. Um, it would be so much easier to just open my mouth. But, you know, I've been, I've been working at this for a long time when I go on a, a gently paced run. Uh, and now I'm kind of bringing it into when I do my high intensity uh, 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 running drills that last 20 seconds, I'm trying to keep 
just knows breathing throughout that whole thing and then do the bare minimum necessary to recalibrate afterward. It might be three big breaths instead of seven or 10. And I, so I, I guess I'm putting this goal in mind of just uh, trying to breathe minimally, not only during the day, but even when I'm out there working out and doing hard stuff or easy stuff. Yeah, the first thing something like introducing nasal breathing is going to do is it's going to slow down your respiration rate. So you're, you instantaneously slow that respiration rate down. And that's one of the big players in this. But the fact is, is most work we do should be nasal breathing. But if you're doing 20 second efforts, 40 second, five, 45 second efforts, one minute efforts, if you're actually doing those in an all out effort, there will be the byproduct of mouth breathing at that. There's just going to be so much metabolic waste that's coming up that you're going to need to offload that, which is exactly where the gear system comes in. Because if I get up to that gear five, I can also gear down Mm. and teach myself how to recover or use breathing to drop down a lot quicker as well. So if I did a 20 second sprint and I didn't need the mouth breathing, but I did it at the end, like let's say in the recovery, we'd use something like a five, seven, nine, where it's like five breaths at gear five, seven breaths at gear four, and then try and get into a gear one within the nine breath sequence mm. of nose only. Right. And so it's just a transition down and being able to get somebody to regulate a lot quicker. And people, you know, I mean, the, the, the interesting thing here is that you can play with this in ways that you're actually hey, I'm going to go do some maximal work. I'm going to go as hard as I can. I can get up to gear five, but as soon as my interval is over, I'm going to force myself to nasal breathe, which is going to be a very, very difficult thing to do. And mm-hmm. But this helps kind of build something like CO2 tolerance, especially working CO2 tolerance and how we're stressing the cells and how to use oxygen and how to what, what's going on with anaerobic, aerobic, all of that. Or... We could use things like hypoxic work. I'm using a breath hold towards the end of my towards the end of my inter- interval so that it's actually stimulating more of a stress response towards the end. And I'm creating a different type of energy work that, that is required there. And that in its of itself is stuff we've played with and are doing. But all of this is all applicable to you know, the idea around the principles behind breath work is we're just taking things from varying sources some from, from varying ideas that have always been there and just applying them into the kind of human performance spectrum so i'm i'm thinking that the um the the major benefit is that the workout itself is going to be less stressful if i if i minimize my breathing rather than maximize as yeah, one of I mean, the, one of the main benefits yeah, that is usually what happens. Unfortunately, the beginning of this for most people is they're getting what's called an ego check. And so they get very, they get, they get very frustrated and they don't want, this is where the work we're doing now is really moving into. And this is, you know, why I've harped on, you know, performance not being necessarily about capacity mm-hmm. is we're always in this especially the general population. It's like, you know, you see people going into CrossFit gyms and it's like, they want to PR every workout. And it's like, yeah, it doesn't work like that. But the idea that it works like that is the problem. And Mm -hmm. so by putting a gut check in, like you're going to be limited to nasal breathing, you're going to have to slow down because you're probably not as efficient as you thought you were. And it's just a different variable that you've not considered. And I'm not suggesting that this is the only way to do this, but it's what we've found to be kind of the thing that is separating this world we've been discussing where people are really missing the gap between where they are functioning aerobically versus anaerobically. And they're stressing themselves out for workouts, thinking that completing the workout in a certain time frame or a certain distance is the goal, when in fact that has nothing to do with the means for staying healthy. Why are you doing this? What's the goal of this? And if it's to to be healthy, well, aerobic activity is at the foundation of our lifespan, right? The better we function aerobically, the better our mitochondria function, right? Mitochondria don't function under, under anaerobic activity. 
it's big stress difference. resilience, right? Uh, I heard I don't know if it was you or a guest talking on your podcast about how the the uh, the, the threshold uh, uh, represented by heart rate where they could nose breathe well, increased over time, over practice. So at first, uh, they could go at 120 beats a minute through their nose, no problem. But then when asked to, to go faster, that's when the mouth opens. And then over time, you can get that thing up to 150 beats or whatever, um, which, mm -hmm. which suggested another big performance advantage. Yes, correct. Yeah. I, I, somebody sent me a video of some coach saying that you can't run, you can't nasal breathe and run more than 60% of your max heart rate. So it's, it's not necessary. And it was, mm. <laughs> and, and, and when people say things like that, it's very obvious they haven't done the work because oh, maybe they have, and it was they, super hard. <laughs> and well, they said, okay, that's it. 60%. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, that's not actually doing the work, doing right, the right, work, yeah. me, me, you know, especially being in exercise science or in and around human performance, you know, that adaptability comes with cost. There was a very, very poorly done study that came out of the University of Colorado, I believe, where they tested nasal breathing against mouth breathing. And they had subjects in two different areas and they tested them and they found that the nose breathing group did not perform as well as the mouth breathing group. Unfortunately, what they didn't look at with the nose breathing group is they had no adaptive process to that. Fortunately, there was another group that actually caught on to this and did a study. We posted it not too long ago, where they actually had a group that spent about six months adapting to nose breathing. And it turns out across the boards, if you take the time to adapt to this thing called nasal breathing, you actually can increase your performance across the boards and you become much more efficient than mouth breathing. In almost every aspect, nose breathing beat out mouth breathing. Uh, but it's with... going to require, it's going to require that thing called adaptation to occur. And so for somebody like me who likes to ride a bike, so I can do intervals at about 90 to 95%, pre preferably nose breathing. Whew. I, if I switch to mouth holding the same wattage, I can feel the stress change. Mm. I can feel the change in the system, but I can't go any harder at that effort. Now, shorter, harder efforts, I will need to mouth breathe. So if I push it further, I will need to mouth breathe because I'm going to actually be stimulating a higher demand for metabolic activity, but controlling it with mouth breathing. But I can function around 300 watts on a bike for sustained time periods, nose only breathing and prefer it. Uh, and that's from, I mean, you've had years of work, but it, it seems to oh, me yeah. that the adaptation can occur pretty quickly, especially when you come in. I mean, I took my first bolt test, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago and it was pathetic. You know, it was, it was under 20 seconds for mm -hmm. um, exhaling and then needing a new breath. And now I don't know if I'm cheating or not, Brian. I know you're supposed to wait until you, 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 I want you to describe the test, but if I, if I push it a little, if I'm looking at the stopwatch, I can get up there over 35 up to 40. But I think my, my true improvement has been probably double from, you know, let's say 17 seconds to 35 in just a couple of weeks. You'll see most people who have low scores with inside something like the bolt will have a pretty quick increase, but the bolt is a pretty subjective. Mm -hmm. test we don't we don't use it because it's too subjective for the reason that you can really start to train yourself to develop co2 tolerance and so you don't know what your first urge to breathe becomes mm. but you cannot cheat an exhale test which is what free divers came up with and the free diving community has been using this forever and it's a max exhale test where you actually sit and you take a full breath and you exhale through your nose as long and as slow as you possibly can. And there is no cheating that test. You can't stop. You can't pause. You can't swallow. The moment you need air or the moment you need to get rid of the air, that's when the test stops. Right. So if you discover yourself pausing uh, or whatever, the test is over. So it's a really controlled exhale and if you get good, you can, I get a little whistle sound coming out of my nose to where I, I know I'm still exhaling. And then, 
uh, you're allowed at the very end to clear your lungs and get an extra five seconds and then your, mm-hmm. then your stopwatch stops. Okay. So the, Correct. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, I mean, I, you should, when you get good at it, it should be questionable if you're actually exhaling. Whew. You should like, you should be thinking like, fuck, am I actually exhaling? But then if you put your fingers on your nose, it starts to build quite quickly. So you should be able to trickle the air out just slightly. And, and I look, this is coming from somebody who started at a 40 second exhale test. Mm. And now, you know, I'm probably sitting in the 90 second range. I've had upwards of two minutes, but that was when I was training strictly to build, build, build CO2 tolerance in a very specific way that has consequences. So a free diver is not going to be a great Olympic weightlifter, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, so as human beings, we just forget that there's consequences for everything. And we think that specialization doesn't have consequences to it. And con- there are consequences for everything and especially specialization. And we are not specialists. We are generalists. Mm-hmm. Do you think there's, uh, a sacrifice if you're going for you know, a peak performance and, and trying to set a PR not every day, but, um, if you want to, compete in um you know high level sport and you're 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 making the commitment to you know do the 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 nose breathing minimal breathing throw that into your workouts now um are you going to come out better somewhere down the line is there just going to be an adjustment like uh like they talk about when an athlete goes on a ketogenic diet and then they they come around six weeks later there will be a ceiling but that ceiling I, I don't think will occur unless we've got somebody young enough who engages in this early enough. And they, you know, I, I'm thinking it's somewhere in that 70 to 90 second range with the, with the max, with the exhale test um, and performance wise. And that has nothing to do with me. That just has to do having a high functioning elite athlete that actually can metabolically handle enough carbon dioxide to where they can control most of what's going on that way. Uh, you're going to have a very uh, tuned in person. So an extreme free diver breaking the records, what was the guy's name? Pippin or something went down mm-hmm. hundreds of feet. Uh, what would be like a, a, a top uh, score on an exhale test? And then what would be someone who's, you know, maybe in poor health and, uh, on the bottom, on the bottom rung. Well, let, let's just, we'll just use an, an easier marker, which is like a breath hold. So Sig Stevenson just held his breath for over 20 minutes. I think it was like 22 minutes. Um, you know, that was on supplemental oxygen and static. So, you know, he was huffing on pure oxygen, right? And then he laid in the pool on face down and just held his breath for 20 minutes, right? Oof. I'd say that marker's probably around more around like the 12 to 13, 15 minute mark without the supplemental oxygen, maybe in a proper breathe up and being monitored. I've held my breath for over just over five minutes in the water. I don't, uh, no, no, no. Statically outside of the water. Oh. Um, so now I had a friend, Mark Healy, who's a waterman who big wave surfer. He holds, he can hold his breath underwater for five minutes. No problem. <laughs> now he's also a big wave surfer and a waterman. He spear fishes. Now, if I if we were to put you know a barbell on Mark's back, I'm pretty sure that's going to change a lot of things for him, right? So and, and and rightfully so, unless Mark starts to train those variables, which then start to have an impact on his demand. I mean, the more muscle you have, the more metabolic demand you've got mm. because you've got more weight on you. You've got more organic, you know, you've got more biological, you know, density that requires energy. So that energy has an off, an off put as well has a demand for oxygen. And it also has a demand to put off carbon dioxide. This is why you will see football players on sidelines sucking on supplemental oxygen. It's because they are actually aerobically inefficient and cannot tolerate. They're so CO2 intolerant. They think they need oxygen. But the thing is, is that they can't get a breath because they're actually CO2 intolerant. Um, this is what tends to happen in a lot of the elderly population as well. But what you also have on the flip side of that is hypocapnic, which is where 
um, or hypercapnic where people become, they, they have excess carbon dioxide. And this also happens in the elderly population um, and, and can be a, a detriment. But these are extreme situations. Mm-hmm. Nonetheless, um, when the need, the urge for air is not a need urge for oxygen. It is a need urge to get rid of carbon dioxide. Remember how I said that in normal breathing, you, you actually exhale most of the oxygen coming out of you that went in. Mm-hmm. So it's not that oxygen isn't available. And if somebody can hold their breath for 20 minutes, that body can store a lot of oxygen in it that can get used. So it becomes how tolerant I am to the CO2 to actually help use that oxygen. And that has some limitations to it. You can end up getting a little too acidic and you have to pay attention to those signals and those signs. But that's the whole point of nose breathing, right? If I'm training, if I actually like spend some time with nose breathing strictly, I'm going to develop my fingerprint to using oxygen because my nose is limiting how much CO2 is going in and out. I'm also engaging an immune system at the first layers of response, which Mm. is a no brainer for anybody. But unfortunately, most people still don't care enough about that, especially in side performance. Especially in during times of a global pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. You want to know how you fight a virus? Breathe through your nose nose. only. Yeah. That's snot that's in there. That mucus, that is a, that is literally a superpower for dealing with virus and bacteria. Uh, Maybe related to that, or just the general question, like the, the the nasal strips, the breathe right, is that cheating or is that, is that going to compromise any of the functionality of the nasal passageway? Or can we, can we throw that on, especially when we're doing a workout? It, it can, it can for sure. Uh, I've, I, I, I've literally burnt through my nose and blown out the turbinates on time mm-hmm. to time. Well, yeah, like there's, there's devices that are like, I think they're called turbines. Mm, the spring these, thing you put in, yep, he's, he's, put in he's opening open his nose people on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. So it opens up those nostrils. So now I've created more of an air passageway than I actually have. So <laughs> I'm moving more air in and out of my nose than I would normally be able to do. And that can have very, I, look, I've used those things. I've used the strips. Um, I think those things have a place with sleep mm-hmm. potentially in training. I would stay as far away from them unless you've got a nose that's collapsing, which you would need, which I would recommend using our nasal development program because we teach people how to start to open up those passageways. Mm. You can manipulate them. You can use it in breath practice and learning how to open up the nostrils. Um, there's a lot of things you'll start to learn, but I mean, when I start to get to higher intensities, I've learned to take a very crooked nose and you can see that. <laughs> Uh, more you got to go on youtube now people if you're just listening because we got so much yeah. value added here well i mean if you look at my nose if you see this on youtube you'll see a very collapsed side and a very open side to my nose when i start training that's what happens mm-hmm. and now i've got two sides that have just opened up equally right and so you learn to start to use your facial structure in a different mm. way and, and here's the thing your face, your body, everything in you, including your bones, is plastic till the day you die. It's entirely up to you. It's our unfortunate part is that we want it now and mm. we wanted it yesterday. And this is where that ego kick comes in to where, sorry, man, it's a process. And But at the end of this rainbow, I promise you, you're going to feel a lot better. You're going to shift adapt. That's I right, love buddy. it, man. Thank you so much. It's uh, always wild times with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about signing up for one of the programs, especially all the offerings, just going to the website. There's a lot of free stuff, but tell us about some of the programming and then uh, also plug your podcast. Yeah, yeah. The programming, sim- I mean, the membership is robust in that we offer training with whether it's uh, our Breathe and Move pr- program, which integrates breathing into some movement stuff, especially with mobility. Our 
conditioning our daily training, which is strength and conditioning with the gear system program attached to it. Both of those programs are the gear system. Sustain, which is about to launch, which is more of your kind of like if I'm looking to, I'm a runner, I'm a cyclist, whatever, and I want to learn how to use these gears, that program is developed for that. Then there's going to be stuff where we have um, a lot of just breath work in general that'll be coming in from whether myself or Emily uh, Hightower, which she'll be doing st- uh, like uh, yoga nidra, neuro nidra, which are what meditative practices that can help reset the system. Um, we have webinars that are on that membership as well that go into the details of just about, I mean, they go into the weeds of everything I've kind of brought up today and further. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, then we have programs that are built in there, like nasal development, the gear system. You can really get in, into all of these things through these systems. And they're on our platform of Teachable, which is our education platform. So it's very easy to integrate and go through and learn these things through these programs. And the podcast? Podcast is our uh, shift perspective with Rob and I. That's basically just he and I kind of screwing around and Love it. Some, sometimes we talk about breathing. Other times we're just talking about life in general, but we, typically it gets a little deeper than, you know, than the norm on things. So that is, it's a that fun is thing. No joke, people. It's fun times. And the, you're keeping your show. You're trying to hit that 30 minute mark, I think. So it's a nice little tidbit. Yes. And who yeah. knows what you're, who knows what you're going to cover in the first, first 10 minutes. That's, that's the fun part. That is, that is. Yeah. Brian McKenzie, people bringing it as usual. We may now both close our mouth and breathe through our nose the rest of the day after this wonderful conversation. Thank you for listening, everybody. (laughs) Thanks for having me, Brad. Thank you for listening to the show. I love sharing the experience with you and greatly appreciate your support. Please email podcast at bradventures.com with feedback, suggestions, and questions for the Q&A shows. Subscribe to our email list at bradkerns.com for a weekly blast about the published episodes and a wonderful bi-monthly newsletter edition with informative articles and practical tips for all aspects of healthy living. You can also download several awesome free ebooks when you subscribe to the email list. And if you could go to the trouble to leave a five or five star review with Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen to the shows, that would be super incredibly awesome. It helps raise the profile of the BRAD podcast and attract new listeners. And did you know that you can share a show with a friend or loved one by just hitting a few buttons in your player and firing off a text message? My awesome podcast player called Overcast allows you to actually record a soundbite excerpt from the episode you're listening to and fire it off with a quick text message. Thank you so much for spreading the word. And remember, be rad.